truth, he didn't belong there. He still said he was innocent and that without a lawyer, the state of Florida didn't give him a fair trial. So he did something most people would attribute to insanity or fairy tales. With a pencil and a prison notepad, Clarence Earl Gideon wrote a petition to the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court has a category of cases it calls informer pauperous cases. That means cases brought to the court by people who are too poor to pay the usual fees and too poor to print up their documents. Poor people can file just with a typewritten or even handwritten document. And Gideon's was handwritten. It was a letter on lined prison stationery. You couldn't imagine a simpler, more elementary way of getting to the highest court in the land. But why would the Supreme Court decide to hear the case of a poor man with no lawyer who was already in prison? Because the Constitution allows even the poorest citizens to be heard and to have an impact on the rest of us. Lightning strikes from the ground up. It may have been sparked by Gideon, but there on the court was Justice Hugo Black, ready to catch it. He was the most influential member of the Supreme Court during his time. Black felt that people should not be disadvantaged in getting justice because they are poor. As a judge, his Bible was the Constitution. We had the best Constitution in the world. And if we would follow it, it'd be all right. He always kept the Constitution in his pocket. And I, as most of his former <coughs> clerks, keep the Constitution. So that when there's a question, you know, you look to the Bible, you look to the language. Alabama Senator Hugo Black was President Roosevelt's first nominee to the Supreme Court. It was big news in 1937. And for over 30 years on the Supreme Court, from FDR through the Civil Rights Movement, on into the Nixon administration, Hugo Black stood for the equality of the ordinary citizen. Black had been the champion on the court for the principle that the various provisions of the Bill of Rights should be applied to the states. The passage of the 14th Amendment made the Bill of Rights applicable to the states. Okay, here's what this means. The Bill of Rights, which originally applied only to Congress and the federal government, also applies to the states because the 14th Amendment says states can't deny citizens fundamental rights. The 14th Amendment, passed in the bitter aftermath of the Civil War, was virtually neglected by the courts until Hugo Black argued that it could no longer be ignored. Every citizen, rich or poor, no matter what state they live in, said Black, is entitled to the same fundamental rights. But when Black arrived at the Supreme Court, the court didn't see things his way. The majority of the justices, these men, believe states should have more independence from the federal government. Early in Black's tenure on the court, a case would test Black's interpretation of the 14th Amendment. That case was Betts versus Brady, and Black was on the losing side. And Justice Black dissented in that case. It's a famous dissent. What he said was, in substance, you can't have a fair trial without a lawyer. So in the Betts case, Black writes, the Sixth Amendment says citizens have the right to a lawyer, and the 14th Amendment says states can't deny that right. That a state can't deny people a lawyer because they are too poor to pay for one. He was in the minority, six to three. The court decided that the states did not have to give everyone a lawyer. Only those who were thought to have special circumstances. Then there had been one case after another in which the Supreme Court had been defining what was meant by special circumstances. And what happened was that more and more defendants and their lawyers tried to show the court that they, their client was entitled to a lawyer because they suffered from some special disability. The rule that you don't need a lawyer was being eaten up by the exceptions. And over the course of two decades, it seemed that each exception proved Black right in the Betts case. And he seethed for 20 years. He really thought Betts and Brady was decided the wrong way. He dissented and he meant it and he kept saying it for 20 years until it came time to decide Gideon against Wainwright. Now that the Gideon case was before the Supreme Court, Gideon really needed a lawyer. So the Supreme Court appointed Abe Fortas. Clarence Earl Gideon, who had no lawyer when he was tried in Florida, 
had appointed to be his lawyer in the Supreme Court, someone who was probably one of the half dozen sharpest lawyers in the United States. You know, they don't appoint uh, the most powerful lawyer in the United States to represent somebody unless they want a deluxe performance. And he wanted to win 9-0. Abe Fortas knew that nine justices rarely all agree. But when they do, a unanimous decision sends a message to everyone that this is a principle that's here to stay. That's something lawyers like to call establish the principle. Abe Crash knows a thing or two about that. I was his field general, so to speak. He really set out from the beginning to establish the principle. That every man, the rich, the poor, and the poor as well as the rich, was entitled to the benefit of counsel. And that principle was very much drove us as we worked on the case. On the other side of the argument was Bruce Jacob, Florida's young assistant attorney general. And Jacob's team was, well, Jacob and his wife. When I was working on the Gideon Brief, my wife and I would drive up here to Tallahassee uh, to this library every weekend or almost every weekend and do research here. He was all on his own. He didn't have a big law firm. He had nobody else from the attorney general's office. I gave it everything I had in, in terms of time and energy and work because I'm a lawyer. That's what lawyers do. Lawyers, when a lawyer takes a case, a lawyer puts his heart into it. <laughs> of course, <laughs> the irony here is that Jacob was doing all this work to argue against a person's guaranteed right to a lawyer. He took that argument and his inexperience into the Supreme Court in January 1963. At the time of the argument, I'd never even seen the Supreme Court. He was really outgunned. I felt like I was caught in a crossfire because the justice over here would ask a, a question. There are nine people asking a question. And one justice would ask a question, and then before I'd answer that question, someone else would ask a question, then maybe a third person would ask a question. Bruce Jacob was interrupted 92 times <laughs> by questions from the Supreme Court. It came so fast. It was a brutal experience. It really was. The irony is that uh, Florida didn't think that um, energy defendants needed lawyers and they didn't seem to think that they needed many lawyers either. We argued uh, essentially the reasoning that was that was used in the decision of Best versus Brady by the Supreme Court back in 1941 or 1942. Jacob took the traditional states' rights or federalist position that states should be able to decide for themselves who does or doesn't get a lawyer without federal interference. Fortis solved this argument coming and argued that because of the special circumstances clause in Betts versus Brady, federal courts were forced to intervene in states' cases. Jacob argued that if the court sided with Fortis, it might force the states to free thousands of other inmates who had been convicted without having a lawyer. The entire country was in danger of having a lot of uh, hardened criminals turned loose on society. But that cannot deter us from doing justice in the individual case. Fortis argued, in effect, that many of those people were sent to prison just like Gideon, and that made the principle here even more important. That the 14th Amendment made it clear that states had to abide by the fundamental rights laid out by the Bill of Rights, including the Sixth Amendment's right to counsel. The time had certainly come when this basic principle of justice had to be established. On the morning of March 18th, the decision was announced from the bench of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Warren turned to Justice Black and said, like this just nodded, and Justice Black said, I have for announcement the decision and opinion of the court, Gideon against Wainwright. Here was Justice Black's vindication for 20 years of dissent from Betts against Brady. He said, we were wrong when we decided Betts against Brady, and now we're finally making it right. For Hugo Black, the vindication was complete. Not only did his belief in the 14th Amendment carry the day, but largely because of Black, the court decided in Gideon's favor, nine to nothing. The decision was unanimous. It was one of Black's greatest opinions. The day had arrived when this principle, for which he had fought for so long as a justice, was now the law of the land. The court had now truly established the principle, hanging right over its front door.